Join us today on Beyond the Lair, where we talk to proud Squamish Nation member Orreen Askew, otherwise known as DJ Osho. We talk to Orreen about transformation, stardom, leadership, and making a difference. Welcome to Beyond the Lair. My name is Gina Jackson Montgomery. My traditional name is Cetacea. I am so thrilled to have you here today. I'd like to introduce my co-host. Hi, I'm Dean Montgomery, and I'm so happy to be here with the amazing... DJ Osho! Woo woo! DJ Osho, her English name is Aureen Askew. Her traditional name, which she just received a few years ago, is Tamalia which she remembers from Hot Tamale, and um, really thrilled to have her today. Orin and, and Dean and I have known Orin for many, many years. I've known Orin for just about two decades now. She is an incredible individual. She is an entrepreneur. She is a DJ. She's an artist. She's an actor. She's a TV personality. She's a hip-hop artist model, politician, and a disruptor, change maker, trendsetter, and now a podcast star. So that is your intro. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to our show. Thank you so much for having me. I love that you're here. Beyond the Lair is a show that's subsidiary to the TV show, which we're going to get into later, The Bear's Lair, which you were a huge part of for season one. But... Beyond the Lair is a show, a podcast show that really elevates entrepreneurs that are making a social impact in community and beyond. And the premise is to give advice, give inspiration, and then also tell your story. So without much further ado, um, maybe Dean, you have a question for, yeah. for Aureen. You know I what? know her. <clears throat> I know. It's amazing watching you grow and develop and you're the star now and, um, you know, I think where a lot of people are wondering is where did this person come from? It's <laughs> pretty remarkable. And you know, from what I understand, um, you're from the Capilano Reserve, North Vancouver. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about who you are and growing up and what's, how you've turned into this, this figure, the stats, the stature. Yeah, for sure. Um, in our teachings, we introduce ourselves uh, in Squamish language, so I'll do that first. The hot squile tenoya, Squamish aslan okmeok, orin askew queen sna, chinwa DJ Osho, tamalia queen kushamein, and what uh, the first question um, I'm from the Squamish Nation? I'm Afro Indigenous from the Squamish Nation. My mom is from the Squamish Nation, and my father's African American from Gary, Indiana, and when I'm doing motivational speaking, I'll ask people if they know why Gary, Indiana is a very famous city. And with a younger group, they're like, they have no idea, right? But then the older people are like, yeah, yeah, it's where the Jacksons are from. And that's exactly right. Um, my dad grew up around the corner from the famous Jackson family. And I'm obsessed with Janet Jackson. I hope I get to work with her <laughs> one day. We're putting that out there in the universe. Oh, good. I thought you sure. were talking about Gina's family. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, I was just at the Jacksons yesterday in Seashelt. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but yeah, I was born and raised in North Vancouver, uh, pretty much the suburbs of North Vancouver. Uh, I went to Carson Graham Secondary School. And then after that, I went to Cap U. And a lot of the times when I was around 13 years old, I would make mix CDs for friends and put my voice on them and uh, burn CDs, if anyone knows what that means anymore. <laughs> but it was really cool. I was like, I asked my friends, I'm like, why didn't you tell me I was a DJ when I was younger? And they said, well, we tried to tell you, but you kind of had to go around it. And music's always been at the heart of everything I've done. So I kind of had to go around it. And I took the radio broadcasting program at BCIT. And I got to work at the Beat 94.5, which is now Virgin. That's how much I just aged myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I got to work at Move 92.5 uh, down in Washington. And it was really cool because the radio market is way bigger than Vancouver. They've got about 50 radio stations in their market. So it was really cool to see and work down there. And I love Seattle. It's just like Vancouver. But it was awesome to see how they're kind of ahead and we're a little bit behind and vice versa. 
So after that, I started my own business. I was working for mobile companies who were charging people thousands of dollars to play off of iTunes. And I said, you know what? I could do that myself. So I cut out the middleman. And that's where I met Tina Jackson when she was working for the Squamish Nation. And honestly, I, I said all the time, I was like, ever since I met Tina Jackson, it's been, it's been gravy. <laughs> <laughs> You are so sweet. I only <laughs> provided the tools so you could become the anomaly that you are. And let's talk about that. When I met you with the Squamish Nation, you were quite shy and quite reserved, and you were very humble with your with your abilities, and um, and you wanted to get some DJ equipment, as you mentioned, to go off on your own and start your own business. And I know that you had a few members that were having weddings or they were having parties and you were just looking for some new equipment and we provided the Squamish Nation has a great had a great trust program where they would al allow some elevation for entrepreneurs what I was fortunate enough to to be able to facilitate but there was there was an incident that changed you forever and can you tell us about that that kind of where you know your purpose is and coming close to losing your life and everything that you've had. Yeah, and this is something I talk about in my motivational speeches. I believe everybody has like a certain date and time where their life like completely changed and how humans are very odd that we have to go through something very traumatic to kind of understand where we're supposed to be and where we're supposed to go. So I remember I got the grant from the Squamish Nation Trust in August of 2012 and then November 3rd at about 8 a.m. in the morning, I remember I was woken up by loud knocks because the neighbors had accidentally started a fire in our townhouse on the reserve that had spread to our place. And I was sleeping at the time, but I got woken up by my amazing neighbors on the other side that didn't start the fire, but um, they were pounding on the door, like not just like a, a little knock, like they were trying to save somebody's life and they did. And I'm forever grateful that I, I woke up because I can see how people freeze and just let the fire go. And there was fire like two feet in front of me. And it was a no brainer for me. All I grabbed was my DJing gear, um, <laughs> <laughs> my livelihood, like yeah. no, no socks, no bra, <laughs> no passport, no money. Nothing else was important. It was just my DJ gear and just getting out of there. And I don't know how to explain it, but it's such an adrenaline rush, you know, and your fire plan goes out the door. You're just, you're just trying to get out of there with your life. And it's interesting because when I tell this story, elders will get upset with me sometimes. They're like, you don't grab anything. You just run. But I'm like, I did, though. And it was right there. And I knew exactly what to do. And ever since then, I feel like, like no pun intended, that was the creator's way of lighting the fire under my butt to do what I really was meant to do on this earth. And I'm so grateful to be here. And I feel like a superhero. <laughs> yeah, your musical instinct took over. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. I think... Um... I noticed personally a huge shift in where you were, where your purpose came after this, after having a traumatic experience. And I think your part of your healing was being able to tell your story. And that allowed you the opportunity to start doing some inspirational speaking. Can you tell us about, because I remember doing a proposal with you. Um, and I can't remember whether it was for the we or I, maybe you can remind me, but when did you do your first inspirational speaking? And then I know that literally set a fire for you mm. to know that you have a greater purpose to have someone hear your voice. Yeah, for sure. About two weeks after the fire, I went to a YES Symposium. And that stands for the Young Entrepreneurs Symposium. The New Relationship Trust was putting it on. And so I got to meet Indigenous entrepreneurs from across the country. So I went out to Ottawa for the first time, never been out east ever uh, on a plane that far. And I wasn't going to talk about the fire because, I don't know, I just don't want people to think that I was trying to get attention from it or, or what have you. But um, I remember I wasn't even going to go to the conference and my family was like, you got to go. We'll get you some clothes. Like, you got to go. This is a huge opportunity. So I went there and the MC was Stan Wesley. Uh, he's awesome. He's amazing at what he does. And we had a break in the conference. And he said, does anyone want to say anything? And it's like I couldn't even control it. I ran up to the mic like, like a spirit was controlling me. 
And I started telling the story about the fire and there wasn't a dry eye in the audience, you know, and people were coming up to me and I had to line up people to like hug me. They're giving me money. Like these are people I don't even know, indigenous people I don't even know from across the country. And they were like, you know, that same thing happened to us. Like, we're so glad you're here. You know, they're giving me blankets. They raised like $3,000 for me without me even knowing. So by the time I went home, I was just like, wow, if I can do this, like from that conference and just keep doing that, keep telling my story. And like you said, it is healing um, to get it out there that that happened and how terrifying it was, you know. And like I said, I'm really grateful that I got out of it. Like my mind actually acted and I actually did something. I didn't just sit there, which a lot of people do from shock. And so that just started another door to a different, different business, which was really awesome. At that time, were you Osho? Were you Oreen? Or was your brand developing? Or, or what, what was that like? Yeah, I was Osho, but my brand was like just developing then. And I got the name Osho when I worked at the Beat 94.5, or it's Virgin now. But they started calling me Osho because they said, everywhere I go, it's like a show. I'm telling a joke in the <laughs> lunchroom or reception or just running around the station. So thank you to Chrissy Corby for that name. But uh, yeah, I was, just, I was just developing. And I really thank Gina for like helping me start the foundation because I think we really try to see if it's, if it's feasible. And when you helped me with my small business plan, we kept it really realistic. I know our projections, you know, I see people who do like really high projections, which is great, but you got to be realistic about it. And I think our goal was one gig a month for a year for like $500. And we like tripled that within like a couple of months. So it's like under promise over deliver, right? <laughs> so that's when I started forming uh, the brand Osho. And I think it's amazing how I can do it because Osho is just me. It's not like a, a total other person, which I'm really fortunate that I don't have to have like a separate a separate life or, or separate vision. It's it's Orin. It's it's all the same thing. Did you do all your own art and uh, and everything that you have? Because it's I love it. So, you, know, <laughs> you, you have your necklace that you wear and your jackets. And was that you or someone to help you? Or yeah, Kitoy Joseph actually designed my logo, and it was pretty incredible. He just did it from a 10 minute conversation on the phone. And I love it. And I actually just got it tattooed on me. So I'm like, this is pretty serious. I've been doing this for 12 years now. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and what I try to do is uh, let people know about other Indigenous artists. You know, a lot of artists give me stuff so I can just wear and people will see it. And like, I'll get compliments. Like in my documentary, I wrote this or wore this uh, clothing line called Salish style. And so they're down in Tacoma, Washington. And they're from the Puyallup tribe. But they send me stuff. But they're like, just as long as you wear it, like, it's all good. And I get compliments in the documentary because I'm wearing their hoodies and wearing everything, right? So it's just supporting other Indigenous artists in that way. I think it's, uh, it's really important. And I know with the Squamish Nation particularly is there's a lot of elevation with entrepreneurs. There can be in many communities crabs in the bucket where you get the naysayers and People are jealous of success, and um, they just don't know really how to relate or understand it. And I know that you've been a huge mentor to elevate people, like you mentioned, in respect of procurement, of wearing other people's um, hoodies and fashion. But you really have been connected to your own. Like, you're no m M&M slash Slim Shady. You are, like, 100% Oreen uh, Osho when you go out. Uh, from your uh, from your lanyard for your necklace to your jackets to your to your hats of your own, do you have people asking you for your gear? Have you thought about starting your own merchandising line? Because I know that I know you have a huge fan base. Yeah, I get a lot of requests, uh, but since I do everything myself, like that's a goal of mine um, to get like an online store because a lot of people do request merchandise. Like I've sold shirts just kind of like a, in a slow range because of when you're an entrepreneur, especially a sole proprietor, you're doing everything. Like I'm my own PR, like photographer, DJ, uh, promotions. Like I do all of that stuff. So that's something I really want to sit down and focus on because I'm getting a lot of requests for merchandise. 
Well, as we as we talked about the introduction about an artist, TV personality, hip hop artist, um, you mentioned the documentary. So maybe we can hear a little bit more about that happen. Usually, documentaries happen after you're gone or when you're <laughs> older. But you had this documentary right now. You just had a birthday. Happy belated birthday! A couple Thank days you. ago, forty one. <laughs> Um, but you had a documentary made for you when you were how old? 39. 39. Tell us about that. Yeah, an award-winning too, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. How many <laughs> awards? And tell us all about that. Well, it's called The O Show, and it was made by Story Hive and Human Biography. And it's been in about 13 different uh, film festivals around the world. And it's a 20-minute documentary on my life. So cameras followed me around for about six months. And it just, I love it because it shows... Like, I can talk about what I do, but it act, something that actually shows everything I do, like on what I do on a daily basis. And human biography is great. I met them when I was speaking at BCIT. Uh, Sherrod Carey, who owns the company, he was in the crowd. And when after, or after I'm speaking, sometimes I'll have like a lineup of people waiting to talk to me. And I'll never forget him because he's, uh, he's one of the real, real Indians. And he has, he has a bald really big bald I was bugging about it a really big bald head and it was shiny and he was waiting patiently and he was just like I don't know what we're gonna do but we need to work together your story is absolutely incredible so from there it went to getting a grant from Story Hive to uh, filming my family uh, filming me like what I do on the daily basis you're in it a uh, former student is in it my mom is in it my sister is in it and it's just I love it and it just turned out perfectly Perfectly. And it's online, too. It's on YouTube now. So, And it came out in 2022. And it's online called The O Show? Yes, it's called The O Show. And how many awards did you win from this? Or did your uh, director, producer? Yeah, we won uh, Best Editing in the short, or Vancouver Short uh, Film Festival and Best Documentary. So I think it's won about five out of those 13 shows, uh, fest film festivals. Perfect. And this person has interviewed many famous people. Let's let's talk about what's in his repertoire of people that he's interviewed. Yeah, he's interviewed like Susan Sarandon, the Dalai Lama, Meryl Streep, uh, Katy Perry, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. He's the real deal. Oh, the Dalai Lama. <laughs> uh, right? I mean, this is, this is, and I've seen it and it's beautiful and I'm super honored to be a part of it because it really is telling your story and it's so lovely. It's so nicely done. So... Everybody out there that's listening right now, if you could go and see the O Show documentary, um, it is really enriching and it's going to get a even closer lens as to who the real person is behind this huge persona. <laughs> Let's talk about, so we've got the DJ. You produced your own hip hop song, uh, Status and Clarity. Tell us a little bit about that because I know that's mentioned in the, in the documentary. Yeah, it is. And a big shout out to my producer, Jane Aurora. I met her uh, when I was on Squamish Nation Council from 2017 to 2021. I met her at a Creative BC uh, focus group. And she came up to me as well and said, you know, I don't know what we're going to do, but we've got to work together. And I've never written a hip hop song or outside of the shower. I've never really freestyled or anything like that. And Jane really brought it out of me. And it was more like poetry and kind of like healing. And the cool thing about that song is I wrote it when I was on Squamish Nation Council. So there's like almost like subliminal messages in there. Yeah. <laughs> or I got to say what I was seeing. And that's what I love about songwriting. It's like what's inside of us. And for me, it's kind of weird how the arts and culture sector is very underfunded. It should be overfunded because it's how people are feeling, right? So we want to know how people are feeling inside. And I think art lets us express ourselves. So that's probably one of my best and proudest accomplishments is co-writing a song, a hip hop song for the first time, Status and Clarity. So, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so how, the impact that, that being on, on council, that really did, and, and why? What was it about being on council that brought out the rapper in you? I think it's more about truth telling and putting it in a way that young people will understand. I feel like I'm a messenger for young people because there's a, there's a line, some people say it's controversial in the song Status and Clarity, that reconciliation is dead. 
And people were like, what do you mean? Like, we're this, Vancouver is a city of reconciliation. It's great. I'm like, it's, it's not, though. <laughs> That's not what the young people are saying. And if you don't know that, then you're not listening to the young people. And it's about reconciliation action because we've heard the term reconciliation. And I try to warn people. I'm like, some people are traumatized by that, by that word. Like, a lot of the survivors, like, my mom is a, a residential school survivor. So when they hear it, they almost, like, roll their eyes because they're not seeing much done. I'm, I won't take away from the stuff that has been done, but we have to see it in action. So I feel like being on council and writing that song, I think it was really important uh, to tell the truth as well. And that's the thing about politics. Like, I, I feel like I'm a really bad at politics, but then people say I'm really good because I do tell the truth. Like, I can't lie. I have the worst poker face ever. <laughs> you, you know what? <laughs> that's, <clears throat> that's so true. I've, I find with so many leaders that we've met and just generally indigenous people across Canada is, is the word reconciliation. It's, it's, it's controversial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. I'm curious. So we've gone to DJ. We've gone to a human documentary. Uh, we've talked about you producing your own song. Um, and it all seems to be uh, in correlation with a healing journey to have your voice heard. Tell us about what, what, why you decided to go into politics. Because chief and council is <clears throat> kind of the stepping stone where you can make a difference. So your voice has been heard. You've been able to vocalize it through your art. And then being able to shift that and then sit with, I believe it was, is it eight counselors or was it 16 counselors? 16. 16 counselors at the time um, to make decisions for the future of the nation. And you were really the, the future of the youth and what the young people were wanting Hence the the spurring of your of your song status and clarity. What was your experience like? And 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 that was just the start of the political career, which we're going to get to the to in 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 a few minutes. Well, yeah, going into it, I ran well because my auntie told me I had to, <laughs> and we can't say no. no. So how I went into it was, you know, I I want to make a difference on a bigger level. You know, I'm doing all this stuff with my business, and I believe in youth education and entrepreneurship so why not get on a bigger level to try to help people in those areas and it was the biggest shift the Squamish Nation has ever had when it comes to council there's eight new members all under the age of 40 and three were from the two-spirit community so that was a huge opportunity to make some changes and I can see the changes that I helped with that are really making changes now like we have a pride crosswalk like down the street on the Capilano Reserve and I was one of the um, head people, had portfolios on that. So it was really important to me. And it's, it's done a ripple effect. You know, the Vancouver School Board did the same thing. And they said the reason why they did it is because of the way I talked about it. You know, I talked about how this rainbow crosswalk glistened in the sun and sparkled. And I love driving by it. So they said, you know what, we're going to do that to our stairs. And I was there to DJ for the kids and everything. Like, it's the ripple effect of that type of change. And... You know, sometimes it feels like nobody's listening to, right? But you just got to keep speaking up because eventually someone will. And it's happening for me. It's, it's really awesome. And I've done it all just by being myself. And that's what I tell the young people. Like, be yourself because the world is going to open up to you more and more when you are. Yeah, I know. It's amazing how when you have energy like you have and, <laughs> and the growth that you get and, and you can't really explain it. Right? Yeah. It's, it's just a movement, yeah. Yeah, totally. So you did one term of council. Mm-hmm. And then you decided to, uh, the AFN asked you for a really um, amazing opportunity. So you are the BC rep for the 2SL, or 2SLGBTQQIA plus council. Lots of, lots of acronym, lots of in there, <laughs> um, acronyms in there. Tell us about that opportunity, how that came to you, what does it mean to be the BC rep for that? And what are your responsibilities to inform that group of esteemed individuals about who you are, who the youth is, and what this large acronym means and to support everybody and be fully inclusive? Yeah, it's it's a it was another amazing opportunity to make some changes, and it's so funny. After I was done on Squamish Nation Council, I said, you know, I'm I'm out of politics, you know. And they what do they say? You need seven years to recuperate from politics. 
but I took about a year off and then the opportunity came up and I applied for it and they, they got me in like right away. And it's really cool to be on that council because the Assembly of First Nations has been around for a while and they're trying to make changes and they're trying to be more inclusive, which I think every organization should do. So this council is the first of its kind and I love working for the BC AFN. You know, we get to represent over 203 First Nations across the country and there's so much work to be done, but it's so amazing when a chief with a cowboy hat from maybe Alberta <laughs> comes up to me <laughs> and says, Aurene, you're amazing. I want you to come to my community and we want to learn. We have two-spirited people too, and they're having a hard time. I'm like, yeah, just tell me, you know, when and where. So it's, it's working and it's just such a ripple effect. I don't know how to explain it, but it, it's awesome. And going to other provinces and working with the youth and I'm about a year and a half into my three-year term, but I definitely want to run again because I think it's totally making a difference um, with the Assembly of First Nations. And you've been well-received. Yeah, <laughs> it's so awesome. And we talk about uh, designing a, a, like a pride flag or a two-spirit flag, and I get all excited, and I was telling the Chiefs how I could DJ the party, and there could be lasers on the stage and smoke, and they're just laughing, like, hilariously. <laughs> they're just like, yeah, we'll make it happen, Maureen. <laughs> <laughs> and you really do have a great connection with kids. We've seen you at the at the, the Bears Lair Youth Entrepreneur Camps, and and every time you show up, I think you win. Your team wins. Uh, wins the business. Yeah, let's talk about that. So we've known each other for almost two decades. Uh, you're much younger, of course, um, but we did a TV show called The Bears Lair. In 2021, we pitched it, and in 2022. We filmed it, and this was during COVID, during a pandemic when the whole world was a bit crazy. And going in, of course, not taking uh, my own advice or the advice of others about going into um, going into a position of entrepreneurism where you don't know anything about the field and you don't have a backup plan. And that's exactly what happened with the Bears Lair is we had an idea, it got put forward, it was agreed on, we're filming in a pandemic, and there was no option to fail. And there was so many people that stood behind, beside Dean and I and supported this whole initiative of our idea. And you were one of them. And you came in as a coach for this groundbreaking show that is like an entrepreneur. It is an entrepreneurial show, but with Indigenous entrepreneurs only. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about that experience, and then we can talk into the importance, which I know is a passion of yours, as we talked about, which is the youth. Yeah, definitely. And I remember when you took me to a meeting with you talking about the show before it was even out, and I thought that was really cool. I'm like, she wants me to like see the process and t kind of teach me how to do it if I was to do it myself in the future. And I think that's what it's all about, you know, passing on the knowledge that you have to other entrepreneurs. And I think that's what you've done. And I think that's what we've been taught uh, as Indigenous people. That's what you have to do. You know, don't hoard, you don't hoard knowledge. You spread it out so everybody has it. And being on the show, I thought it was awesome because there's these incredible entrepreneurs from across the country and their ideas are just, just blown away, you know. And I feel like, Indigenous entrepreneurs are different. And it's, it's kind of hard to put it into words, but I don't want to say we care more about our business. I just think we're, we're more careful with it, especially, you know, people who are artists or they're selling like beadwork or things, kind of things like that. It's really personal and it's, it's from the heart. So I think I'm just doing what you did, you know, <laughs> you know, teaching me the way and just doing it and creating a path for them. I think that's what it's all about. Because if you're... If you have a powerful platform, you should be helping others get to that that platform as well. And that's just something we've been taught. It's just it's just like I can't even really put it into words. It's just an automatic thing that we do because we've been taught that. That's such great advice for one thing. And when you when you have your own audience and um, and your your public speaking, like what's your demographic? Do you find who's interested in in Osho? Is it I mean, you you touch so many people? How do you see that? I think I really connect with youth and students at like university. They can really understand. And then the questions I get afterwards, they're just like, they're really incredible. 
And it's just things I, I didn't even think of. Like, you almost think that you're, they're not paying attention, but they totally are. They're listening to everything and some of the, uh, the feedback that you get. It's, it's pretty incredible. Like, I was just in Kitchener, Ontario, speaking at a college, and I had these kids come up to me. They were there with their mother, and they're asking about songs or questions about my song, Status and Clarity. I was like, oh, wow. Like, that was just a little part, but they were totally onto that. So, uh, and it ranges too, but I think I, I connect most with young people and I think it's because I'm a big kid. That's why. <laughs> and, and is it a diverse? Is it indigenous youth? Is it general population? Like what, how do you find? Yeah. At first, like when I first started, it was indigenous people, but now I have an agent, um, something I've been working on for over 10 years. I think I've just been really stubborn to let things go. But the fact that I have an agent now and they represent some pretty heavy hitters like Julie Black and Cardinal Official and Anderson Cooper. But now it's just, it's all crowds, which is really cool. And uh, at the college in Kitchener, I was the only Indigenous person in the room. So they were really grateful that I came there and spoke about uh, Indigenous issues and, and things like that. How do you find that it's received? Um, because I, being, being multicultural, in respect of that, because I always, because I, I worked in the indigenous space, I very close with my indigenous side of the family. When I identify and I tell people and I said, oh, my aunties or what have you, or my indigenous side of the family, they look at me and they're like, what? Blonde, fair skinned. You know, when, when you talk about blood quantum and you talk about being indigenous and, and Dean as well, Dean's Métis, and same thing, we're very fair looking and, and as Indigenous people, we can look in so many different ways. What, how are you received by both of your cultures? I would say because I grew up um, in my Indigenous community, I feel like I know more about that uh, intersection. Whereas in the Black community, like I didn't grow up too much with my dad around, but I didn't, I wasn't really indulged in that, like I was in Indigenous culture. So it's interesting when I have my hair braided a certain way, people will be like, oh, yeah, you totally you totally look indigenous, but you present as black or you totally look Afro indigenous. You can totally tell. Right. But not a lot of people can. So sometimes when I go to events, an indigenous event, they're kind of like, what are you doing here? And then I tell them who I am and where I come from. And they're like, oh, OK, you're supposed to be here. Um, maybe because I'm not wearing a cedar hat or anything like that. Um, but, yeah, it, it's interesting I, and I get that too because I don't I don't look indigenous, so people just assume that I'm just black. Well, for sure, and I know that um, again with the political voice during Black Lives Ma Black Lives Matter, I know that you were uh, quite vocal. You had your megaphones downtown. I know the mayor was you wanted him right beside you, you right beside him, um, and you were at the forefront of that representing um, both Black Lives Matter, Indigenous Lives Matter. Tell us about that. Yeah, that was back when um, George Floyd was murdered. And that was something I've never seen uh, in Vancouver before or around the world. You know, people were marching. And I'm, I'm pretty good friends with Tegan and Sarah. I was actually in one of their music videos. And I remember when I spoke at the art gallery at one of the um, gatherings, Actually, I just saw it the other day, the picture. That's why I'm remembering it right now. They were in the crowd and they had masks on and they were like, we heard you. We're so proud of you, my friend, you know. And I'll never forget that when I did the territory acknowledgement and I spoke, it was so quiet. I could hear my voice echoing through the whole entire city of Vancouver. And I can't even put it into words. It's like never seen anything like that before. Everybody coming together and, you know, protesting against police brutality because it's something that it seems like a video game. You know, black people are getting killed on television, you know, for being being reprimanded by by cops, you know, and I wouldn't watch the George Floyd video for a long time. I couldn't. And then I did. And I was like, wow, how he was crying for his mom. Like, unreal. I can't even believe that has happened so many times down in the U.S. And people were like, oh, it's in the U.S. I'm like, but it still affects us up here, you know. And it's so interesting being Afro-Indigenous because Black and Indigenous people are so similar. And I don't want to say it's a stereotype, but a lot of the times Indigenous people and Black people butt heads. So I feel like I'm here to kind of put us together in the same room at the same table and 
realize we have so many similarities and we need to work together because this butting head stuff is, is not working anymore. <laughs> What is your message that you're really trying to get across to the youth, right? Whether they're indigenous or black or too spirited. Yeah, too or... spirited. What is like what is what are you driving with people with this shy little girl who has turned into this phenom? I'm really trying to get them involved with politics. And I remember being that young person thinking, you know, oh, someone else will take care of it. I don't really care about that stuff. Right? But we're at that age now where we have to take care of this stuff. So it's trying to make it fun kind of in a way for them and not so boring because it doesn't have to be boring. <laughs> Maybe some of the stuff, but just getting them interested about it and knowing how much power they have to make change. Because I look at my mom's generation and then I'm from the first generation that didn't go to residential school. And then I look at this younger generation, I call them my nibblings, the young people, you know, and they're not so jaded from residential school where my mom has or had a hard time telling her feelings, a young person now, they'll totally tell you how they're feeling. They'll tell you what they're going to do and they'll tell you what they're not going to do. And it's so, and I'm kind of envious of them because I'm kind of in the middle of that where I do that sometimes, but it's kind of like, uh, I don't want to be disrespectful or anything, but they have no problem saying it. And I think it's, it's amazing and it just shows you the impact that they're going to have on the world. Like they're the change that's going to make this world great. So I have so much hope for them and I can't wait to push it over to them so they can take care of it and then take care of me. Hundred <laughs> percent. And you do a lot of mentorship with the youth. We have uh, the Bearsler Youth Entrepreneur Kids Camps that you've coached how many now? I think about five. About five. So we've done 30, 31 so far. We've taught about 850 kids all over Canada about entrepreneurism. And we put the kids into groups and each group gets a gets a coach. Can you tell us in your experience, because I can tell the similarities with the youth and I have a lot of hope for youth as well. What is it like coaching kids and what are the similarities that we find? Because the kids that we teach are 11 to 18 years old and everyone fights over you being their coach, particularly our kids, <laughs> if they're ever in a ever in a camp. Um, but. What is your experience witnessing not only working with kids in your group, but the kids in, in the other groups as well and, and where the youth are going today? Well, I love doing those camps because you look at the difference between the first day and the last day. You know, the kids are kind of shy. It's like almost some of them don't want to be there. And some of them are acting out. Like some of them I would butt heads with. I'd have to take a break, go hide in the bathroom for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't have kids. I'm anti, I'm anti Osho, but I don't have any kids. So, <laughs> and it's so funny because, you know, they do something to make me mad. And then it's almost like I was holding a grudge. And Gina's like, you can't be like that with kids. I'm like, because I am one. I'm still mad at them. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to divert back to uh, and not be triggered by by things like that. We got we always got to remember we're the adults, and uh, and that's what makes me laugh about you because you are a big kid. Um, but I mean, we do witness some some great transformation. And and what is what is what's the commonality amongst what you see? That these young people want to be entrepreneurs for sure, and I think it's it's good to grab their attention at a young age because I wish. I was younger when I like learning that type of stuff. You know, I only started my own business when I was around 30 years old. So you can imagine when people are younger, they have those teachings, you know, about target market, like what it's like, branding, education, just, it's just awesome. I think the, the whole entrepreneur camps, the idea is just like, I don't know why they weren't around before, <laughs> but they are now and I think they're, they're incredible. You are a really, really great coach for that. And I, um, I want to talk about some awards because you have won many. So we've talked about the documentary and that you've, uh, that's received many awards. But you got, I know I nominated you for an award in 2015. And you and I were doing the nomination package together. And we were all about, and that's what I love about you is your idea with marketing, with the, the front of the cover of the, of the, this is when back in the day people where we used to actually hand things in in paper and deliver it. And it had a, a record for the, for the front of it. So it would stand out. And we had a great proposal package together. 
you did end up winning the 2015 BC Indigenous Achievement Award. Uh, in 2018, you've won the Standout Award for the Vancouver Pride Society. In 2021, you won the Alumni Excellence Award for CAPU. In 2022, you've won the International Indigenous Hip Hop Award for DJ of the <laughs> Year. And for 2024, you are nominated for the YWCA Women of Distinction Award for Design, Arts, and Culture. Tell us about <laughs> this. <laughs> Tell us about these awards because, number one, there's a lot of people that uh, elevate you and rise you up. But what do you think about winning all of these or and when to be winning maybe a new one pretty soon? But how is it for you to, to be recognized like this? It's incredible. Um, it's hard to put into words, but it's like people are actually noticing what I'm doing. And I'll go back to the 2015 uh, Indigenous Business Award. I remember you helped me with my uh, proposal and you were saying things like, if you don't win, I'm going to poke my eye out, like yeah. with a pencil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stick a pen in my eye if you don't win because we put so much effort into this. Absolutely. So it's like when you have someone like that in your corner, like how can you fail? <laughs> how can you fail? And you've been a really huge part of um, mentorship to me and – it's just like I would call you with an idea and you're like, OK, if this is what you want to do, this is how we're going to do it. I'm like, is it's feasible? You're like, yeah. <laughs> of course it is. So it's just so awesome to have support like that. And I've got a lot of women in my life who support me in, in that way. And being recognized in Vancouver, my own community, I just feel like all the hard work is paying off now. And that's what I tell people, too. You know, maybe it won't happen overnight. But if you keep at it, something you're passionate about, it's there's there's no way you can't lose. You can't lose. Yeah, it's so and, and recognition for everyone in their work is important, right? It's what keeps us going. Let's talk sports. Let's talk sports. Um, you have been recognized and you have more jerseys in your closet from all of the professional teams um, in the in the city for sure. You've DJed for the Vancouver Canucks, the BC Lions, the Whites Caps, the Warriors. You've opened up for Russell Peters and Kevin Hart for the Great Outdoors Comedy Fest last year. Let's talk about that. And I, I know, and Dean and I have both witnessed, we've been at games where the energy level has just been to the roof the minute that you start playing your music. And how does it feel to, to be on that grand stage and be able to shift the energy? It's amazing, like, growing up in Vancouver and playing for all of the pro teams. I just, in the last couple of years, it's just been so incredible. And I love Canucks games. I've been going to them since I was very young. And just being able to be there. And so many people in the community have been so supportive. And it's a really cool time right now because they're doing different nights. So the Canucks will call me on Indigenous Celebration Night. Like, it's a no-brainer. And because I'm so intersectional, I can do three different nights, right? I can do Indigenous Celebration Night, Pride Night, and Black Excellence Night. So oh. for them, they're, I think it's a treat for them because they're like, we know exactly who to call. Like, we're not scrambling for somebody. And it's just so much fun. And I love sports. I've been playing sports since I was younger. I used to play for the North Shore Indians lacrosse team, ladies lacrosse team. And sports teach us so much about teamwork and communicating. So to DJ on a huge screen, like the Jumbotron, so much fun. I think I'm addicted, too, because <laughs> it's like, oh, they didn't get me this time. Like, what's going on here? <laughs> Maybe next time. But it's so incredible. And I have so much support. So many people posting videos of me on the Jumbotron. And um, I, really, I like DJing at the BC Lions games as well in BC Place. So it's interesting because in, a, in the... A few days, I would have, you know, a gig at Rogers Arena, and then I'd have a gig right across the street at BC Place. I don't know anyone else who can say that that happens to them. No. Yeah. And you you really are the it girl. I always, like, half joke about it, but you really are the it girl. You've um went from DJ, documentary, acting, what have you. What about, um? tell us a little bit about the Yoko Ono. Everyone knows who Yoko Ono is. She <laughs> broke up the Beatles. 
Um, but she is also an amazing artist and humanitarian. Um, so tell us about how you got involved with her exhibit at the Vancouver Art Gallery, because that was out of left field and <laughs> very interesting. Yeah, so many opportunities just fall on my lap. And sometimes, you know, when you get a huge opportunity, you're almost reluctant to say, like, like, why me? Like, maybe it's a mistake. They emailed the wrong person. But one day the Vancouver Art Gallery got in touch with me and they said, you know, we want to um, we want to platform host nations artists. And I said, oh, well, I, I DJ and stuff and do music, but I draw stick people. I'm not I don't do like sculptures or anything like that. They're like, no, that's fine. That's OK. Um, the theme is water. So whatever comes to your mind like do that and I said okay so I hung up the phone this is a hilarious story <laughs> um I went on Amazon and I ordered a fishbowl a $25 fishbowl and my mind was just my creative mind was just going so I put a little bit of water in the fishbowl and then I put an afro pick inside with the pride flag and then I had my medallion my DJ Osho medallion around it and that was my piece right so I showed it to them. I showed them a picture and they were just, they were blown away by that. <laughs> it's just what I thought of in about two minutes. So that was on display for about six months. I really miss my medallion though. I, I wear it every day, but they, they kept such good care of it. And we had like insurance on it. And it was really cool because they had a QR code on my piece uh, for my song status and clarity. So when you went to the art gallery, when it was in the Yoko Ono exhibit a few years ago, you, it would play my song status and clarity. So it's just something that I can say that I've I've done uh, <laughs> in my lifetime. Well, cool. did you see how many people were, were listening to the song through that? Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's so technology is amazing. Yeah. No more burning CDs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> you are an incredible, incredible human and uh, and a mentor to many. And I love how you you do have such a huge following of supporters and people that want to elevate you, but you go and you give that back as well. What is your, for our last question, what is your advice to entrepreneurs that are following you, that are inspired by you, that one day want to grow up to be an Osho? What is your, what is your advice to them? Yeah, I get, I get asked a lot how I do what I do. And people want to do the same thing. And I always say the same thing. I say, give back to your community. Because they're the ones who are going to have your back. They're the ones who are going to share your posts. They're the ones who are going to represent you first more than anything. And I remember being very shy when I first started. And I didn't even want to put out a DJ page. And my DJ instructor at the time said, okay, but this is what you want to do, isn't it? So make one. And your family and friends will like your page and it's going to be amazing. And that's exactly what happened. It's so nerve wracking putting yourself out there because you're opening up your world for criticism and nobody ever wants to do that, right? So start in your community, get back in your community, volunteer, you know, volunteer for youth events, like anything. And that's where it started for me. And now I get to give back to the community that gave to me and I think that's the best advice I could give to people is that's where you want to start. Wow. It's great advice. <laughs> great advice. That's amazing. Well, what an interesting and amazing and inspirational person you are. And personally love you, uh, professionally love you. And I think people are going to find this a really interesting glimpse into who you are behind all the glitz and the glamour and the publicity that's going on right now. So... Thank you so much for coming on our podcast and uh, live your dream. Find your purpose. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to Beyond the Lair. Please follow us, download this episode, and follow us on social media on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and TikTok. <laughs> <laughs>